Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, so first of all, if you're not that excited about the cold, I'm coming from the Weizmann Institute, and there it's all warm and nice right now. And um, actually, I don't know how the organizers was, would find it, but the fact that this is all about uh, how to change the world, my talk, in a way, is the fact that, you know, the place I come from now is the, uh, in wintertime is the time we have all the wildflowers and it's beautiful outside. I'm really interested not in how to change the world, but about how to make it such that the nice things about it would stay the same. Okay, and this is the motivation for the current talk, and I hope you'll see how this fits together. And so in order to really understand how do we keep the world as we enjoy it, we have to understand how does it work. And even though maybe we've heard about the new changes and what Elon Musk thinks about how the world works, let me give you my version of what really drives the world. And really, in driving the world, we really sustain in many, many different ways on a secret recipe that plants have uh, developed throughout many, many millions of years. And this is how it works. Um, they came up with something pretty simple uh, that is uh, in a way much more sophisticated than all the, what IT can offer us today, and that is taking air, mixing it together with an ability to get some water and the energy that comes from sunlight, and transforming that uh, into what we really need, which is food and fuel, which drives everything that then all the high-tech, robotics, whatever, would actually sustain on. The issue is, in terms of thinking about to change or not to change the world, is that in this process that plants do, they actually require most of the land and the water resources that are available to us on Earth. So if you want to be able to make it sustainable and to continue that in order to have all the other technologies running around, we have to find a way to keep on having them run this for us, but with less resources, or at least the same amount of resources for a growing population. So how would we be able to achieve that? This is sort of like what we're interested in the Weizmann Institute in doing. So here's the first step. The way plants are able to run this recipe is by the fact that they have this fantastic machine within them called Rubisco, which has been perfected through evolution for hundreds of millions of years. And it's the one that knows how to take air, or more accurately, the carbon that's within air, and transform that into food and fuel, which all come from sugar. And so we're studying that machine and trying to think, how can we utilize it such that we could achieve more with less? And this whole adventure started with two brilliant PhD students were joining my lab when I came back from the Harvard Medical School. And they had this brilliant idea of trying to revisit the problem of how nature does it in order to try and see if we could achieve things faster with the same amount of resources. And as you'll see, this is a long-term drama. It's not that in one quick year we could solve the problem. We're starting with basic science that could have significant implications. And so I'd like to share with you the several seasons of that drama that I was involved in. Okay, so if you'd like, let's start with episode one. So episode one, these two PhD students are coming to the lab at Weizmann Institute and start coming with the following question. Can we try and make it faster? And for, in order to be able to do that, we need to study biology in a way that's easy for us to study. For that, biologists, molecular biologists, have this pet that we love to work with. You can see it depicted here. It's a bacteria that we understand better than any other living organism, better than we understand ourselves, if you like. There's been huge loads of information that we've garnered throughout the years, but there's a one small problem with using that for what we're interested in, for taking carbon dioxide and turning it into uh, food and fuel just like plants do, and that is the fact that this bacteria, like most bacteria, actually likes to do the reverse. The diet of this bacteria is built out of taking sugar, just like our diet, and feeding out of that diet to build everything that this bacteria uses. And so the question that these uh, two students posed was, can we try and change the diet of this bacteria? Can we try and make it such that instead of using sugar, just like plants, it could take air and use it in order to make sugar? And this is what I'd like to tell you today, what happened in the first season, then in the second season of trying to achieve that goal. And so the idea is, can we try and make this bacterium, also known as E. coli, to basically fix carbon from the air, which is a scientific term for what we're talking about. And so these two guys were looking into the horizon, but then came this guy, which was just entering uh, his master's, and said, you know what? I don't believe these guys one bit. 
This sounds to me like completely theoretical, even though you came up with all sorts of fun way in order to be able to do that and you've published paper on that. I don't believe it can work and I'm willing to spend the next year of my master's degree in order to prove that this could not work in practice. Basically, he was telling us, you know what? There's this saying that, also this guy is Nivan Tonovsky, which is really one of the heroes uh, of really turning, from moving, if you like, from season one, the theoretical one, into the practical one that started with him joining the lab. And he said the following, when thinking about these things, in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. <laughs> and he's a very practical guy. So he said, you know, I need to find a way to spend the next year in showing uh, whether this could work or not. I can't do it by myself. So this is a, Niv is a pretty charismatic guy. He went around the campus and looked for the people that were just either finishing their masters, finishing the PhD, that could join him on the team or try to say whether we could change the diet of the bacteria. Here's the, the first team that he was able uh, to pick around. So what you see here are the people that were experts in different things in order to try and achieve that uh, ch change in diet. So beyond Niv, he found Lior. Lior was really, at the Weizmann, he was known as like the cloning ninja. Cloning is this thing able to tell bacteria what to do, and a ninja, you know what does. So he's able to do that with bacteria. And Shira Antonovsky was uh, studying plant biology just across the street, and she helped us start to do the experiments, and you see how that evolved. So the first stage that you have to go around is to try and understand the metabolism, this ability to transform some materials into others. You know, it used to be called alchemy to be able to transform some material into a diff completely different compound, but now it's not alchemy, it's biochemistry, which is really enables you to transform one thing to another. And bacteria are super smart at doing that. And for that, there's many, many different steps, and you can see some of them depicted there. If you don't completely follow that, that's completely fine. We don't always understand that ourselves. But we did understand by combining both the biochemical knowledge and teaching computers, we could understand this network and understand what kind of thing you had, need to do and change in the diet in order to enable the bacteria to do the thing that plants do. And for that, we understood we need to remove some of the genes in order to ensure that it doesn't uh, fit itself out of the regular things. And you need to add some new genes. This is all part of this cloning ninja stuff. So we planned that for several years. We did it in the lab. And then the day came where we could start running the experiment. So, and that's where uh, really the thoughts of Niv came around. Okay, now let's, we could check what happened in theory, how it works in the lab. I don't know if you guessed it already or not, but the next thing that happened, complete failure. Everything that we planned and arranged, and this was after a few years of hard work, we have a whole team. We had lots of support from the EU on trying to fund that. And now it was too late. <laughs> now we couldn't go back and say, you know what, you know, we had a nice idea, it doesn't work, that's it. We had to find our way in order to move forward from here. So we needed, like, you know, if there's a secret recipe for plants, now we need a secret recipe in the lab that would help us move forward. Anybody has a guess what, that, what would, could help us there? We need to find a way to have the bugs in our design work in the bug in our lab. So we needed to find something to enable doing that. And for that, we had a hypothesis. Our hypothesis was that if we give enough motivation for the bugs to solve the problem, maybe they could solve it themselves. That is, the strongest tool that's available to us in biology is evolution. That's what brought us here, and that's what could take us further by using evolution in the lab. So we worked hard now on designing a way such that the bacteria would be able to solve their problems. So here is how it works in practice. Every experiment that we do, we take bacteria that were already uh, rewired in the way that I've discussed, and we're putting them into a machine that keeps them super starved for many, many days. You can see every experiment could easily run for two, three, four months. Where the hope is that after a few months, they be able, through lab evolution, to solve the problem such that now they could use the lots of air or CO2 that we're putting in into making their own food. This is the idea. And in practice, we started running these experiments. And here's a layout of how these things work. You wait 
after a week, after two weeks, after three weeks, after four weeks, usually nothing much happens. But then after about two months, something was happening there. We started to have more bacteria, and everything that we supplied, the energy, the air, started to uh, decrease. I wasn't super excited because I had all sorts of ideas on what could go wrong here, but the students were excited. Why were they excited? You know, after you work for a few years and then you do an experiment of two months, anything that happens, you're getting excited. <laughs> Any change is good by now. Now you need to check if really the change that happened is really what you expected or, what it, uh, or something else. And the evolution is notorious uh, for the fact that even if you plan something, it could find some very creative solutions to achieve something else. So really, it wasn't clear from the fact that we saw some change, whether it's a change that we were interested in. How can you check on that? We need to find an experiment that would enable us to test whether it's actually taking air and building all of its biomass from it and all the sugars. For that, there's a cool trick, and that is the fact that you can run an experiment in which what you're doing is you're labeling air. There's also a way to label air. And then you take the air, you look at the, whatever are the components, and now you'll be looking within the bacteria to see what happens within its uh, biomass, all of its components. There's cool machines in order to be able to do that. And we have them, and now we could start looking at all the different components of the cycles that achieve taking carbon from the air. And lo and behold, when we were looking inside the cell, we could find that 90%, roughly 90% of all the atoms there are actually coming from the air that we've put in. And I don't know if you're excited by that, but we were super excited by this point. Because this is what Neve was really working on. This is now almost six years down the line after he said, you know, he's willing to spend one year to prove the idea wrong. So, you know, life also evolves, and from one year to the other. But by now, he could really be proud of the achievement that he got, you know, this went all through the scientific press, the popular media, of being able to really transform a bacteria to be able to uh, take air. And that's something that, you know, when I was starting to talk about this, and so like the vision of the lab, people were smiling at me, and you know, so you look like a nice guy, but this is really pretty naive. Clearly, you don't mean that you're actually going through the whole way. And you know what? I was just like looking for something that could have a vision that could be interesting. I wasn't sure whether it would work out or not. But the nice thing in academia, you enable that freedom that you can try and, you know, follow that. Even if you won't reach the end, you learn a lot of interesting lessons along the way. And this was definitely one, and then a second, and then a third, and then a fourth season, where in each one, we got new lessons, tens of papers by now, you know, coming about all the different aspects of it. And we were able to give them the freedom to be able to do that. And so Niv was super happy by now. Now, this again wasn't done only by himself. He had a whole other team of charismatic, interesting people joining him to try and, and do that effort. What they were able to achieve is something that really shows us again that this statement that evolution is smarter than you are is true also in our case. But at the same time, you can also use evolution to make you smarter, which is what we really understood here. And we found exactly in what way. Let me share with you just one example. What we learned from evolution is that when you want to do this balancing act of taking air, usually the bacteria have a hard time, and that's why our original design did not work, because you're able to get that air inside, but that air is so like, if you like, is being taken in and then breathed out, spent, just like, you know, if you're earning some money and you just start and spending it all around, that's what bacteria are pretty good, because they're just earning things and then spending them. In order to be able to do the same trick that plants do, they had to know how to fine-tune their expenses, such that overall, the revenues on whatever money they're, uh, they're investing would be larger than expenses. So we saw that there's all sorts of molecular knobs that we could sequence in the lab, we could find on the DNA what changes evolution did, and actually it was a balancing act of having less expenses for the same uh, revenues that they have. And this was really the key to ensure that the air is really not being lost, all the carbon coming from there, and that's what made it sustainable. That we could never do by our rational design, even though we're thinking we're super smart. This is, the only th this is something that only evolution knew how to do, and it helped us in the lab. So with that, I'd like to wrap up. This is the lesson that we learned. This is all part of a larger vision that we're trying to implement, not only at Weizmann, but the scientific community in general, because this is, is not something that could be achieved by one lab or two labs, not in one year, but in concentrated effort. And that is really to revolutionize the ability to achieve both of our food and, you know, and our fuel, 
not necessarily in order to change the world, but also to keep it such that, you know, the places where I enjoy seeing wildflowers just, just outside of Weizmann would be left there that way instead of needing to have more fields to grow more food or more uh, biofuels or anything like that. Thank you very much. I'd like, just like to mention there's a whole team of other people I didn't get to talk about the work, but they're all working together in order to achieve that. Shira Amram, which you saw, is just starting the evolutionary experiment where we still did the manually. By now, uh, this is from her wedding, together with the new people uh, in the lab, all working on trying to see how can we uh, teach bacteria to do cool stuff and how them and evolution could teach us new lessons. Thank you very much. Thank you.